Welcome to the Talking Serverless Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Jones, joined today by Thorsten Hoger. Thorsten is the CEO of Timos, where he's adv- advising customers on how to use AWS with a focus on serverless computing. He aims to improve development processes through automation and building efficient deployment pipelines for customers of all sizes. Before Timos, Thorsten worked as a developer and CTO of Germany's first private bank running on AWS, where he helped migrate the core banking system to the AWS platform all the way back in 2013. Since then, he has become an AWS serverless hero, contributed to several open source projects, and is a frequent speaker at conferences, meetups, and community events. How are you doing today, Thorsten? I'm fine. Um, So one thing, I'm a DevTools hero, but part of the hero program. Yes. Gotcha. Yeah. No, thank you for the clarification there. Um, really appreciate that. Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, we're, we're about 13 days into 2022. How is everything going? Yeah. So, I think everything's fine. It's not what, what you want to hear right now, but it, it's, it's fine. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it was, uh, it's, been, it's been a couple of uh, interesting years, to say the least. Um, we're, we're 13 days into a new year, so hopefully, you know, we can keep all of our optimism and hopefulness. You know, it's like at peak levels right now because we still have <laughs> 11 yeah. and a half months. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and so I yeah, think... So I mean, for, yeah, go ahead. I think for, for the serverless um, and for, for the cloud computing world, um, it's also a lot of opportunities. So a lot of things that are now done that would have taken years otherwise. Yeah, absolutely. And that's definitely a lot of the meat of this conversation. Um, to kick things off, I did want to kind of give a back a backstory to who who is Thorsten and how did you get to where you are today and how did all this stuff unfold, um, serverless and, and so on. Um, so if you could start from somewhat the beginning, wherever you want to take that, um, what's been your journey to serverless and to, to doing what you're doing today? Yeah, so as you said, um, I was starting as a software um, development engineer and also DevOps before it was called DevOps at um, at a private bank in Germany. Um, we were migrating our core banking system to AWS. Everything on EC2, VPC was just started, so it was pretty pretty um, normal virtual servers. And then in 2014 and 15, it, uh, things coming up like lambda and what is this and what can you do with it and always looking into things and more and more yeah trying to look into these services seeing services like this and then starting them with with small projects but even bigger projects then and since then using it one on, on one hand for low volume or low traffic apps like yeah i don't want to pay for it if it's not used and if it's used, it's just there. I don't have to care about it. And on the other hand, it's very easy to scale for high traffic apps. So I think for all types of apps, there, there's a benefit here. And that's why I'm trying to use it for everything that, that's coming to my desk. Like we need something like automation for some tools or we want to configure something on an event in our AWS accounts from a management perspective, from an ops perspective. But also from application development, like, yeah, we have this small application here. What can we do? And that's when I went into doing more and more apps, defaulting to serverless. Like, there, there's a question from a customer, like, we want to do this or that. And it's, yeah, let's try to do it serverless. And if we fa- fail, then we think of something else. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's really cool. And thank you for sharing kind of the, 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 the story there, the story arc. Yeah, we've definitely seen that too, where it's like... Um customer like when customers are asking to do it it's like um there's sometimes there's that you grow to such a level where it becomes hard to take risk and i think we see that with a lot of enterprise companies and i think that's a perfect way of describing it it's like let's just experiment with it you know if it doesn't work we only spend a week doing it or a couple of days doing it and it's and it's like we know from our end that we can't actually do a lot in a couple of days or a week with serverless but for traditional companies that are trying to build out software applications you know in a non uh, non AWS heavily leveraged way and building all that stuff from scratch a couple of days or a week is almost no time at all <laughs> to, do, to do something. So you need, you need multiple weeks, months, um, and you need very many, like lots of more people to basically be involved in that process. So yeah, that's really cool. Um, and so kind of going off of that, um, some of the insights that you were giving towards the end there probably plays a, a pretty big role in 
and what you do at Timeos on a day to day basis. And so for the, the audience, uh, do you mind giving like an overview of what your day to day looks like as a CEO, uh, consultant at Timeos um, and, and where your time mostly gets spent? Yeah, so basically, um, I'm self-employed as a CEO and consultant at Timos. So I'm doing, yeah, consulting with customers, which is my paid job. That's what customers pay me for. That's where the income comes from. And the CEO tasks are, yeah, you need to have some bureaucracy. You have to do taxes. You have to write invoices and things like that. So that's the CEO part. But basically, it's, yeah, customers um, contact me like, yeah, we had somebody write a serverless application for us and we want somebody to review the architecture or we need um, a security review of something we built because of whatever certification it's needed or we want to build something. Can you help us advising our developers how to do it or build it for us? So that's basically what customers approach me for and then we see how we can solve this and how I can help them uh, in the best way. And yeah, and then we, we implement it or we do reviews uh, or, or we do reviews and then we re-implement it also happens a lot. So that's basically day-to-day things like looking into the problems the customer faces, searching for the real problem, not the solution they have in mind, but looking for the real problem and then finding a serverless solution to it. Yeah, this is super interesting. So, you know, two things that popped out there were um, that I'm just generally curious about, like what like size of clients do like end up coming and like what experience levels? Is it more towards like they're just now starting and then they're reaching out to you or they're they've been around for a while. They might even have engineers that already have experience with it and they just need like, like you said, maybe like an architecture review and things like that. How does that I have, make up? Yeah, it's look? startups or agencies doing small applications for a customer and then doing reviews. But it's also, on the other hand, it's it's enterprises doing like, yeah, we need some new service. We don't have capacity. Can you just implement some service for us? Because yeah, we have one thousand applications running in our in our enterprise, and we want one more. And and something that's kind of interesting with this that I've 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 never asked this question, but like, what do you think the link is between like a early stage startup that might be reaching out for help or maybe adopting serverless, and then also on the opposite side, enterprises. And of course, we know that there's startups that aren't doing it, and we know there's enterprises that aren't doing it. Is there like a th- like a common thread between those two, where it, like it doesn't matter about startup or enterprise? It's like there's just a culture or something in- internally that's happening that allows them to. Have you seen anything that's like a common a commonality between all these companies that are adopting serverless? So I think one one of the biggest factors is first the company, no matter the size, needs to make sure that. Yeah, we are using AWS. Our main focus is not how to leave AWS, but we are using it, so we're committing to it, and we use all the services they provide. If they have this mindset, I don't think it's a matter of the size of the company, but this mindset is important to say, we can use serverless because we are committed to AWS. If you use AWS and you always think, how can I leave it if I have to, then you will never think of using services or managed services or serverless. Mm, okay. Now that's super interesting. Yeah. I think it's, yeah, like you said, it's a mindset. So if they're seeing it, cause if there is that type of, um, I've heard an analogy before of like, instead of trying to create like new pies, uh, they like the company might be focusing on like, um, cutting up the pie that's already existing. And that, that almost has a, a bad effect on innovation and thinking, you know, about new things that could create new value. Um, and it's more about how do we just, you know, cost reduction, send things offshore, Reduce, 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 um, and so yeah. So I guess if they're on, they're on AWS. If they're already leveraging those things, if they have a mindset that sees the value of it, and they're not trying to, uh, you know, squeeze things down or think about like a multi-cloud scenario or how do we switch away from this if we needed to, um, and optimizing around that. Have you seen that uh, come up uh, very frequently with the people that you interact with, like the idea of multi-cloud and just the the thought process and thinking of like. If something goes wrong, how do we build our entire system so we can move it? And is that a is that a, an abyss or is that like a good thing? Like where where do you I land mean, on? I, I think there are two ways um, companies um, land in, in in this spot. So one is like thinking of the cloud or AWS as a data center. So they think, yeah, it's a data center. So we have servers. We are doing things there. They don't look at the rest. It's a data center. We are expanding our data center. That's it. 
Um, and then they don't care what name is on this data center. If, if there's an AWS or Azure or whatever, it, it's a data center. Um, that, that's one part of, of the people. And, and the other part is, yeah, for real or assumed regulatory purposes, they think like, yeah, we need to be able to migrate off of AWS in a week or in a month. So we need to build everything so that it's possible. And so going to a different type of question, um, you know, everything over the past two years pretty much has been remote now. Um, was this normal for you prior to all the things that have taken place uh, from 2020 to now? Um, how has that shift in paradigm been? And free, speaking from like a developer's perspective, has that been more beneficial than being in an office or less beneficial? What are your thoughts? Yeah, so it shifted completely. So before um, all of this, I was traveling to customers like four or five days a week with like four to nine hours of train rides a day. So I was, wow. yeah, like traveling 500 to 600 hours of train rides a year. And from one day to the next, it was, yeah, you're not going into a, into a train for now two years. I haven't been to a train. So, yeah, it's completely different. <laughs> but, yeah, it, it's working. I like it. It's great. And most interesting thing is it's basically the same clients. So it was like clients, oh, yeah, that's not going to work. You, you need to come to the office. You need to come to our location for years. And then, yeah, but right now we can't. Okay, let, let's find a way. And it works for two years now. So... Basically, it works and it's fine and it's great and I will never go back. Awesome. Yeah, no, thank, thanks for that insight. Yeah, it's like um, I was traveling in, uh, I was traveling to a client also like in 2020 um, in January. And it was like that really early part of 2020 when no one really knew what was going on and like we didn't have the vocabulary to really describe it. Um, but we just knew something was like kind of brewing. At least it showed on like the TVs at the airport. Um, are you feeling sick? You know, that whole thing. Um, and then, yeah, like you said, just on a dime, just everything switched. Um, and since then, uh, been completely remote. And, well, we actually opened an office, our first our first office for a serverless guru in, uh, in Portland, Oregon, and signed the lease and got a little plaque that said the company name. And I felt so cool about it. And that was the end of December of 2019. <laughs> and then by, and by March, we had to close, we closed the office and we didn't use it in, in, in like most, we didn't use it in March like it. So we had about a month of being in a physical office before we had to close it. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's. And for me, it was like, I was moving into a house um, in April 20. So this was really great because before I was living in a flat with, with a kid and it was like, yeah, it's okay. But now I have my own office in, in my house and it's, yeah, I can just sit there. I could stay there for weeks. It would just work. Yeah. I remember going through that type of thing in my head too, where I was like, okay, I can just use like a co-working space and then I'll just have like a smaller apartment and then I'll just travel to that. And most of the time, I'll just sleep in my apartment. And then it became, you can't do that anymore. <laughs> so it's like, now you need a little bit more space. You need an extra room. And then, like you said, getting a, like an actual office and stuff set up. Um, hmm. it, was, it was a big, it was kind of a shift for me because I, I mostly uh, work out of like coffee shops. I like just like being outside and stuff. And so then when everything was like locked down, like Portland was in complete lockdown for about a year straight. Um, yeah, that was, that was a transition. Um, but yeah, so far getting used to it. How, how has that been for you? Are you used to it at this point? I think you said you're never going back. Is that like... Yeah, I'm not going back. So the main yeah. thing is um, now, um, for a year now, I have two kids. And it's like, okay, I, I can see them. I can just... Oh, yeah, there, there's a meeting break. So let's play with the kids. So it's... And before it was like, yeah, I'm leaving the house at 5 in the morning, coming back at 10 in the evening. Kids are asleep. All the time. So mm -hmm. now it, it's a different thing. So, yeah, they know that they have a father. <laughs> that's amazing. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's awesome. Um, so, yeah, I, I've, I've definitely been able to, like, 
mix in like breaks and stuff where it's like, okay, off a meeting and I can like cook food at my house, <laughs> which is really nice. And yeah, I'll like, run and then wait in line and then try to get food and then rush back to the office and eat. And, and yeah, so that's, that's awesome. Okay. Yeah, cool. Um, and uh, kind of, you know, switching a little bit into something else. Um, what, what was the overall, cause you know, you're doing time most now, you've been, it sounds like you've been doing it for a while. Um, what was the inspiration behind that? At, like at what point did you wake up or was it over a series of time where you went, okay, I think it's time to start this thing and start building it. And, and how did all that kind of unravel? So the company itself existed for, for years because I was always a bit of the, the self-employed person and had it as a side gig and, but what was um, employed at, at this bank. Um, then in January 15, I switched companies to a different company, um, creating mobile device management software, moving them to the cloud. And a little bit more than a year later, I was like, yeah, but that's not what I want to keep doing. So I'm looking for something else. And okay, I migrated two companies to the cloud. So why, why pick another employment? Why I move this company to the cloud instead of just being a consultant and doing this on a day-to-day basis for more customers. Um, and that's what, what led to this. Like, yeah, let's do consulting. The time seemed right. I had some good connection with two friends, um, opened their consulting business a year earlier. I had connections with some other agencies that could need some help. So I could start with, with a customer base from day one. And then... Yeah, it was great, and now it's okay, and I'm just doing it, and I'm not doing something else. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, no, that's super cool. Um, yeah, it's always nice to hear like the origin story behind like companies like this because it's like um, mine was somewhat similar. I, I had I had built up some skill with like serverless and AWS, and and then I just was had free time because um, the the role that I had gave me like uh, it was like a, a nine to five type job, and I didn't have kids or very much responsibility at all. So I was like, okay, I still want to work. I still want to do stuff on the weekend. And I just started applying to jobs uh, for freelance and then got one of those and realized, oh, wow, I can actually do this. And then here we are. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> that was like the CEO thing earlier when you're talking about like taxes and legal and accounting. And I was like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. Um, uh, so yeah, so we, we we met each other in person in, in, in Vegas. Um, so uh, reinvent twenty twenty one it happens. That was that was cool. Uh, I believe you know we met at the Serverless Lounge, uh, which for the audience it was like this small uh, small restaurant bar, um, uh, and basically they had like free drinks and some food and things like that. And it was a whole bunch of uh, you know serverless people and uh, was it serverless and containers lounge. Was it both together? I think it was the serverless and the containers heroes okay. and some people that are yeah. in this space. So I'm basically in the yeah. DevTools area, but doing a lot of serverless and containers naturally. So yeah, there was this connection being there. Uh, yeah. So um, meeting there, super cool. Uh, I met like uh, Jeremy Daly, uh, Alex Abri, obviously you, um, and a whole bunch of other people uh, from various different companies and uh, and it was yeah that was like a cool, cool very cool experience for me as well um and so how many how many events have you been to have, have you been to very many reinvents or was this the first one so it was the fourth reinvent for me okay and yeah i was really looking forward to, to being back to, to reinvent because yeah the event before reinvent was reinvent 19 for me so it was like <laughs> yeah two years of not meeting anybody um, but yeah, it, it was a fourth reinvent. But for me, a reinvent is is always like meeting people, going to yeah serverless launch, some other meetings with people. I think during the whole week, I normally do like two or three sessions. So okay. and the rest is just meeting people, going to the keynotes, obviously, going to to yeah. evening events, going to to lounges meeting with, with the community, meeting with people that are doing things, meeting with the teams at AWS. So what they are up to, how they could improve things. How is it like overall for, I noticed that this was my first one. So I think I, I did a, a poor job at the beginning of pacing myself um, uh, in terms of like 
interactions with people, how much stuff was on my plate, how much walking I was doing, how much alcohol I consumed at what, what time, <laughs> you know, um, how, how is that? Have you learned the ropes enough to just be like, okay, I know how to, uh, be present in the morning and in the afternoon and also be present during like the, the late evening events and then not overwhelm myself or is it overwhelming for you too? It is overwhelming. It was very overwhelming the first time. So this is completely normal. Um, but I think then it, it's a little bit of a personality thing. For me, it's like I'm landing there on, on Saturday. So I'm giving myself the Sunday to find into the vibe, to, yeah, remember where everything is in the Venetian and to settle down. And so, oh, yeah, now I'm there. And then it's Monday to Friday nonstop. Like, yeah, going to events, doing things, reading emails when I'm back at the hotel because then in Germany it's the day then sleeping like four or five hours and the next day and then there's a trip home the whole weekend so I'm normally leaving on Saturday there's it's a whole weekend of travel because of time zones and, and duration everything that's where you can then relax and if you come home it's like okay everything's fine but there is no pacing it's just it's four or five days full speed and then yeah you can sleep on your way home yeah no completely um i've, I've noticed that like I, i got i was pretty affected by time zone shifts i'm sure that must have been way more intense for you how like how long on average after a trip like this does it take you to reset back to waking up at normal times and feeling like you have energy and and not being fatigued um that might be discouraging for you but i have no idea what jet lag is Oh, well. So I never experienced it in, in these four years or four times I was there, neither on the way to the US nor back. So, yeah. That's no, awesome. <laughs> no idea what this <laughs> should be. So That's great. Well, there that's like that's the that's the answer. Um I guess follow on podcast we can talk about diet. <laughs> Do you meditate? What what is <laughs> what's the secret? No, I think uh, I, re yeah. I really think the one secret is sleep on the plane. Mm. And always sleep to the target time zone. So don't sleep when it's night mm. where you started. Sleep when it's night at your destination. Because then you settle into this uh, this rhythm. Yeah, I definitely didn't. That's exactly what I didn't do. So yeah, that makes <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, so yeah, and then getting to uh, some of the announcements that came out. Um, what were some of the announcements that you were the excited the excited the most about? Like and. And you've like interacted with maybe more than others in the past, you know, month, month or month and a half. Yeah. So my favorite announcement definitely was um, the CDK V2, so the second version of the cloud development kit, because that's the area I'm involved most with, like being contributor there, advising companies and using CDK, writing articles, books, conferences, whatever about CDK. So that that's my thing. So the CDK version two was a big announcement for me. Not new, because yeah, obviously I knew about it, I knew what it's, it will be about. But the thing is, it ended some kind of limbo phase. Like, yeah, we know that V2 is coming, so we should start using V2, but it's not there yet, so we should not use it in production. But should we really start something new with V1? So the announcement made it clear, yeah, you can use it now no discussions of, of versioning anymore, just USB 2. Uh, yeah, so CDK V2, that's that's uh, really exciting. Um, something that is interesting, we just had a, a client engagement where we're upgrading from, or just making sure that it's compatible for serverless framework V3 from V2. And there was some like, not necessarily breaking changes, but just, I would say it's obviously it's a breaking change. If you have to add anything for it to be backwards compatible, then it, it is a breaking change. Um, so ended up communicating with the serverless team. They ended up changing that, but I've been pretty heavily in that over the past week. So what has that been like for you in terms of CDK V1 to V2? Is there like crossover there? Is it backwards compatible completely? Are there changes that had to be made? Is it a whole different way that you write stuff? Like, what does that look like? So CDK V1 and V2 have two major differences. So one is the packaging in V1, Every service was its own NPM package or Python package or whatever language you use. So it was like hundreds of packages you could have as dependencies. 
With a V2, it's only one library. But the namespaces are all the same. So the only thing you need to change is yeah, some imports, but it's straightforward. There's also even a tool in the, in the CDK um, command line interface to just migrate your imports in your source code files. So it's just rewriting imports. Everything else stays the same on this, this thing, and you lose all the version hell. You have like, oh, yeah, I'm using ECS in version 117 and EKS in version 118 and IAM in 119 and everything breaks. So this is gone because there's only one package. Mm. So it, it's not non-breaking. The only thing that is breaking, but it's not a breaking change from V1 to V2 per se, is all the things that were deprecated during the lifetime of V1 are removed in V2. So if you use something in V1 and you ignored all the deprecation warnings, then it breaks in V2, but that's expected. So gotcha. if you have a pretty recent V1 code, pretty recent meaning CDK 1, 100 and up, and you don't have any deprecations, upgrades should be running the mi import migration and that's it. And so to kind of go into that a little bit more, my, my CDK knowledge, as we, we discussed <laughs> at reInvent, is, is not, not fully there compared to like serverless framework, for instance. That last part that you mentioned, uh, was that like there's an ECS package that's, you said, versions 118, and now it's just one? Is that, am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, so, so we, there is a weekly release of CDK. So the last, or the, the current V1 version, it's maintained for another six months is the 1.139. And in, in the V1, every service, so it's based, in, it's based on CloudFormation, so all CloudFormation resources are packaged by service, like there's an ECS package and a Lambda package and an API gateway package and so on. And these were all separate packages. And you had to make sure that all the packages you use are in the same version, exactly the same version. And now it's only one library. It's called the AWS CDK lib. And it contains all the source code, so you cannot mix it with, with versions, and that's great. Yeah, no, that sounds actually like amazing. So that that sounds like a huge improvement, honestly. Did you run into yeah. that a lot, or see that a lot, where people had mismatching things and had weird behavior? I happening? think I think it was FAQ number one. Like, what does this error mean? Yeah, it means that one of your dependencies has a different mm -hmm. version. Gotcha. So did you have a, uh, I'm sure you've had, to, I'm sure you answered that question a lot over the past like year plus. <laughs> yeah. Is it? Yeah. Okay. So there's probably a It was a lot like of... the default, uh, default debugging step one. Let's, <laughs> let's look into the package log if all versions are the same. No. Okay. okay. That's your problem. <laughs> that's, well, that's huge. It sounds huge. So in terms of that now being there, obviously that's way more simple. Um, do you think that that's going to play very well for adoption of CDK moving forward? Um, yes, because for adoption, this has two benefits. One is not 10 minutes into your experience with CDK, you get weird errors and, and throw everything out. And the second is you had to know which packages you need before. So, oh, I'm, I'm adding a role now. So I need to install the IAM package. So I need to go into my package JSON or, or requirements and text file or whatever and add the IAM package. But I needed to know that it's in the IAM package. Now, you have one library and everything is just there. Oh, I need a role. Oh, yeah, there's an import. I can import it from IAM.role. Okay, perfect. So, so that's a thing. All the imports are just there. So auto-completion in VS Code or IntelliJ just helps you. Everything's there and you see what's, what's provided. And before, you needed to know which package to install to have some resources at hand. Gotcha. So basically, with a serverless framework, you need to know which plugins there are. And if you don't know this, you do everything manually. And that's yeah. exactly what happened in V1. People were gotcha. not using it because they, you needed to know where it is. Uh, and now it's just there. Yeah, that was a super, super valid point. Um, something that I think serverless framework still has trouble with is the, the plugin ecosystem. In one way, the, the number of plugins and your ability to create a plugin um, allows for you know, extending that like baseline serverless framework, but then in terms of main, maintaining those plugins, knowing if they still work with updated versions, and it's like the core ones are are pretty well known and things like that. But there's often times where you know we we come into a project for a client and we're like, oh, for this packaging thing, you can use this 
this Webpack or this ES Build uh, plugin for serverless framework that'll pack at your Lambda functions way way more optimized. But that knowledge is pretty hard to like reach if you're yeah. if you're not doing it for a li- like every single day for many clients and see how you know the commonalities that pop up. And so uh, you know, kind of moving down the list, I know that we're we've been talking for probably around thirty ish minutes now. Um, something for the the audience. You, you said that you do a lot of. Um, uh, or you didn't say this yet, but um, that you do uh, indoor rock climbing. So what? When did that? When did that start? How long have you been doing that? And is this like bouldering? Um, and yeah, um, yeah. So I think we started this. So we, meaning my wife and, and I, like in 2015, 2016, like this. I think it was, yeah, 15, where we just said, yeah, we want to do something together. So having a sports we can do together. Yeah, having some kind of activity where you move instead of sitting in front of a computer so that was when when, when indoor climbing ca- came in and it was yeah it, it's great it's fun we, we can do it it's not this competitive thing you, you don't need to make it a competitive thing you can just do it for fun and that's what we're doing so we're going to do the gym and and doing yeah rock climbing sometimes bouldering but normally top rope or lead um so yeah going there but now, for obvious reasons, I think the last two years we did it twice with now two kids and a situation. It was not yeah. that easy. Yes. I hope to to do it again. So my big, big one is now three and a half. So I'm trying to start with my kid and re- restart climbing and then take him there and say, oh, yeah. Because the thing is really with, with kids, it's really great. There is no fear. So they right. just do it. Yeah. It's like, what, what if I fall? They just don't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, they have nothing to fear. Yeah, that's a really good point. I, I, I've, uh, surfing is, you know, surfing is fine during all this because, you know, you're out in the water and you're away from people. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've noticed that. Like some of the, I'll be out there and I've only been surfing for maybe like six months or something, but I'll see a kid that's out there, no fear at all. Yeah. And we'll just, you know what I mean? <laughs> like they don't know, they don't know to fear the the reef underneath or that the waves could like break your board or something or it could hit you in the head you know like um that's it's yeah that's amazing so yeah that's a really that's a really cool activity um and, and thanks for sharing that um yeah yeah that's really cool um i also uh heard that you're an avid cook um and so uh something that you know shout out to jonathan on our team um you know what what's your main specialty dish what do, what do you what is your your favorite that you like to cook I really love risotto, mm. <laughs> but it's something that takes time. And that's what many people underestimate. It's like, yeah, it's cooking rice. No, it's not cooking rice. It takes like half an hour minimum just to, yeah, cook rice, <laughs> but but it's great. And it has to have the exact right consistency after that. So I love that. So do you go to rest? Like, so if you went to a restaurant someone gave, and you order risotto... You can immediately tell <laughs> um, how well they cook that rice. I will only order it if I'm pretty sure that they will do it right. So at an Italian restaurant, they will do it, but not somebody, yeah, we have risotto. And then it's like, yeah, you cooked rice and put sauce on it. That's not risotto. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Um, yeah, that's super cool. Um, uh, I, I'm still trying to get into to cooking myself. I keep it pretty simple. Like, rice black beans corn maybe some salsa (laughs) you know stuff like that maybe some tofu or something in there but um yeah so and then uh as we're like coming to a close uh i know that you you wrote a book on cdk i know that you're doing a lot of stuff in the community um what what type of things you have coming up what type of things you want to let the audience know about so they can reach out to you or or start getting involved with the stuff that you're you're doing yeah, so definitely, as you mentioned, um, to, um, together with three other AWS heroes, we um, published a book, the CDK book, um, six weeks ago during reInvent. So we waited for V2 to be there because all the examples are in V2. So we just waited for the announcement. So yeah, it's there so we can publish. So that's one of the things um, we, we did um, yeah, the last six months, I think, preparing everything. It's not like... 
how to use all the packages because that doesn't make sense because there are hundreds of packages and hundreds of constructs and it's not um, how to use packages, but it's more like what's the concept? How do you do delivery pipelines? How to test your applications? How to structure your projects? How to write constructs? How to use CDK in enterprises? All these things are in the book. And yeah, happy if anybody wants to look into it. It's as I said, the cdkbook.com. You can just find it there. And the next things that are coming up with basically the same group of group of people um, is doing the next iteration of the CDK day. I hope we will start planning in the coming weeks and have it ready by April, May, something like that. So CDK day is a community led one day conference um, where we talk about all things CDK which is not only the AWS CDK for CloudFormation, but it, there's also um, a cloud development kit for Terraform written by HashiCorp. Um, there's CDKs, which is a, C a cloud development kit for Kubernetes deployment descriptors and other projects that are using this constructs model for Azure, for project management, for different things that are coming up. And we want to integrate all these community things and talk about them at a community-led one-day conference. And we had this in 19 and in 20 and 21. And now we are um, yeah, working on the third edition. Amazing. Yeah, amazing. So for those listening, definitely check out the CDK Day. Uh, also check out the CDK book. Um, that's super exciting that y'all put this work in knowing that version two would eventually come out and then have your entire book structured around it. Um, and then you don't have to rework anything. I love that. That's that's good good foresight there. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, but I think that does it. Um, thanks so much, Thorsten, for being on the podcast. Really appreciate you having you being here yeah, today. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, to those listening, this has been the Talking Serverless podcast with Ryan Jones. If you like our show and want to learn more, check out talkingserverless.io uh, or visit our website slash podcasts um, and then, of course, if you're watching this on iTunes or Spotify or Google Podcasts and this was valuable, definitely leave us a review there. That helps a ton. Um, and, of course, join us next time as we sit down with another fantastic guest. <laughs>